Warning, this video may contain violence, sexual themes, and a lot of swearing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone, I just wanted to tell you to wait till the end because I have an announcement that I am making regarding uh, me doing other things besides YouTube. March Madness D&D Edition! I want to see which of the 12 standard D&D classes is the best and I want all of your help to decide. I assigned each class a number and rolled to see which would be fighting first. First up, we got Fighters versus Warlocks. I'll drop two comments down below, one that says Fighter and one that says Warlock. Like the comment you want to win and they will move on to the next round. Remember, I'm only counting the likes on my two comments. I'm interested to see why you think your side should win. Feel free to comment down below. You've got till 8 p.m. on March 4th to decide. And fight! A bard is a child who wants you to pay attention to them while they do their cool trick. A wizard really, really wishes that all of their intelligence meant something in the world. A barbarian really wishes that all of their anger and rage had any value. Paladins and clerics really just want to feel like they're serving a purpose. A rogue just really wants you to think they're clever or possibly dangerous. And the DM? The DM just wants to know that you enjoyed the story, that you uh, enjoyed the game, that you had fun, that you picked up the little plot lines that they dropped everywhere just for you. Despite all their control and skill, fighter really wishes that they could just solve the problem with the point of a blade. A sorcerer really just wants someone to tell them they're special. A ranger is just someone who really wishes they could find their way. A monk wants their enlightenment to justify their violence. A druid embraces nature and all its power, not for the power but because they want to feel like they belong somewhere. A warlock wishes that their deals got them something worth having. An artificer wishes that they could build something that would make them happy. All right, it's been speculated. Most people think I'm a bard, but like one person thought I was a rogue at some point. But let's find out once and for all. Ranger! <laughs> find your celestial being name start with the first three letters of the month you were born next at the second letter of your first name now at the first two letters of your mom's name last at the last three letters of your favorite color
this is where you want to be. It's everything you ever want. It's everything you ever need. You don't need to tell us your character's hair color, or their eye color, or the shape of their nose, or cheekbones, or any feature in particular unless that feature tells us something about their personality, their background, or the world they inhabit. Because readers are really good at filling in mundane physical details like hair color and eye color. So focus less on predictable visual details and more on unexpected details that reveal the character's personality. Details like their homemade earrings, the scar that splits their left eyebrow, the smell of chlorine in their hair, or the guitar string calluses on their fingertips. Today's magic item is the Bleeding Heart Shield. This rare magical plus one shield allows you to protect your friends from harm at the cost of your own safety. As a bonus action, you can choose one friendly creature within five feet of you to protect. The target's armor class increases by a number of points of your choice up to plus ten, but your own armor class is reduced by that same amount. You can't reduce your own AC to less than five with this item. The effect lasts until the start of your next turn. If either of you move further than five feet away from each other, the effect immediately ends for both of you. You can use the shield's ability three Three times without penalty. After that, each time you use it, you must make a DC 11 wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the sacrifice you are making takes its toll on you, and you become vulnerable to all damage until the start of your next turn. This bypasses any resistances you have. All of the creatures around you will be able to tell that you are weakened. Then the DC of the next save increases by one if you succeeded the save, and by two if you failed. The number of free uses and the DC of the wisdom save both reset at dawn. Happy belated Valentine's Day! I was a wife, I was a mother, I was alive, now I am a monster, I do it again for my son and lover, and I'll find my way to them on the day of my resurrection. were talking and they said there's this thing on TikTok about a wheel or something. Is, is that a thing you actually do for our games or what? Hmm? Oh no no no, that, that's just for a thing on TikTok, you know? I was just doing it for a bit. I'd, I'd never do that for like, you know, an actual game. That's, that'd be wild, right? That's a relief because, you know, it'd be really weird for a DM to do that kind of thing, you know? One hour later. Those fuckers found out about the wheel. I don't know how they found my account. <sighs> this is only one thing to do, I guess. Snitches get stitches, Brad. This is who my best friend is. Oh, this is who has a crush on me. Ooh, this is the person who hates my guts, like would kill me on sight. Bo hates me and can't make a move. I guess this is who I end up dating. After Jester and I get into a huge fight, who comforts me while I cry? <laughs> He's only doing it because he wants her. Who do I end up kissing after my fight with Jester? Who catches me in the act of cheating? Oh, uh-oh. Does Caleb tell who ends up murdering me for cheating on Jester? Yeah, that's fair. I hear a sound. See them in the dark. I know there's someone there. Why don't you believe me? Maybe you're right. But I heard a dream. I'm always quick to rage. Yeah, I kind of had an interesting idea for a campaign I could run. Then why don't you do it? I have to DM every single week. And I'm dying to play. Please help. I'm proud of you. 
You only have a good reason to be proud of anybody. But if I had to think of one, well, you're an adventurer, aren't you? And life itself is often a quest of its own. The quest that you've been on from the very beginning. We're all leveling up our own way. Whether that be learning a new spell. Remembering to do self-care. Finishing your quests of the day. Or even coming to terms with identity you chose rather than the ones you were born with. Life is filled with random encounters and conflict. And I'm so proud of how far you've gotten. <laughs> if not now, I hope that one day you can be proud of yourself too. I know that I am. These are the most unfunny and annoying things that someone can say. so blown away by the response I've gotten. I've gotten literally hundreds of messages from people about playing a D&D &D game uh, with TikTokers, and I would absolutely love to do that. I could probably feasibly only run one game right now, but I would love to run one. Um, so I'm looking for TikTokers that are over 18, that have availability during the week. Like, weeknights are my best night to be able to do any kind of D&D. &D. Uh, my I prefer... Uh, Tuesdays and, and Thursdays, um, and we'd probably play every other week using Roll20, which is my this is the on, one of the online Dungeons and Dragons platforms that's there that I have a lot of resources on. Uh, if you're interested or you know another TikToker that plays D&D &D and might be interested, say something or tag them, and let's get this going. And then, of course, I'm going to share this game with you guys. I'm going to let you guys know what's going on because it'll be it'll be absolutely amazing, and I'll probably share highlights and stuff as as we go. So if you're interested and you want to play some D&D, let's get some TikTok D&D going. Yeah! For those of you who didn't know, I play Dungeons & Dragons. And a lot of people have been asking me, Jerry, how do you play Dungeons & Dragons as a blind person? So first of all, I'm going to show you my dice. And this is going to become a series because I'm inspired by a guy called DiceAndDragons.com. He has a website where he sells dice and D&D &D stuff. He's awesome. He's on TikTok and I'll tag him down below. But I am about to show you my dice. Here is my dice set. They are very big and they cost me around £60 to get from my gaming cafe from a guy who 3D prints stuff. I am going to roll a... what shall I roll? A D20. Find the dice. Whatever's on top is what you get. I got a four. This is so useful because I can play D&D independently and not rely on the dungeon master. Why are you acting so nervous? And why are you sweating so much? And why do you look so hungry? And... No, no, wait. It's not what you think. This is a big misunderstanding. You've got to believe me. I... Listen, I am telling you. You better listen to me. My fellow DMs out there, what is a mistake that you made in your campaign that wound up to be the greatest thing you did in your whole campaign? I'll go first. Um, I let my players sports bet on Coliseum matches, and they wound up with way too much money. And I mean way too much money. And, uh, thankfully, what they did with the money surprised me, but in a way that didn't, you know, break the game, uh, they bought a tavern. This tavern, you know, was your classical, oh, you meet in a tavern kind of thing. And it wasn't supposed to mean much. Uh, it was called the Shattered Cock. And uh, anyway, um, we have t-shirts now, so that's how that's going. Gold pieces are not the same as dollars. Copper pieces are dollars. Gold pieces are $100 bills. When your players walk into a small town and they buy something with a stack of gold pieces, people should look at them like they're super sketchy. Who do we know who does that? Well... Criminals. Criminals from movies and TV. They're the people who will say, oh, I want to buy your house. Oh, it's not for sale, but I've got a stack of $100 bills. Now is it for sale? That's right. The people of your world probably look at your characters the way that the random people in Breaking Bad or The Blacklist look at those main characters, because what they're doing is super sketchy. As soon as your party finds a lot of gold, I like to remind them with other NPCs that 
that's not normal. Most tavern keepers, most innkeeps, most farmers, they never see gold pieces, at least certainly not that many at a time. Think about how that makes them feel to see someone like your party members walking around with a lot of gold. They probably think their party members are dangerous and want to keep their distance. Come down and follow me down, down to the lights of Galway, where there's fine sailors walking the town and waiting to meet the ladies there. Watch now, we'll soon be along, he's finer than any sailor, so come on now and pick up your spoons, he's waiting to hear you play them now. Here today and she's gone tomorrow and next she's going to Galway, chicken around and off to town and won't be back until morning. This is how I got my wife into D&D in three easy steps. Number one, buy cute sparkly dice. Number two, convince her she needs more of them in case she loses one. Number three, offer a game of where she can use the shiny click clack math rocks. And now I have a dark elf stripper in my sessions. No, nope, yep. I didn't expect that ending either. So guys, if you want more of these, hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Impotence <laughs> beam! Huh? Oh my god, you have a spell like that? You mean, I won't be able to... Seriously, couldn't you have just set him on fire or something? No. No, 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 no. You guys, relax, relax. It's just my flashlight spell, and I just yell, impotence beam. Look, impotence beam. What the hell, man? Don't hit me with the impotence beam. Guys, it's just a flashlight. It only works if you really believe it causes impotence. Look, don't even think about it. It's a common misconception that wizards have to say the spell they're casting. Look, watch this. Earthquake! Huh. Whoa. See, look, I said earthquake, but that was a spell that summoned butterflies. What? You clearly made an earthquake. Yeah, I'm pretty sure those butterflies just came out of the grass after you made you the earthquake. Wait, he's coming back. You gotta give me some kind of counterspell or something. I gotta be able to perform, you know, please. As long as you leave this village in peace. Oh yeah, I I'm done with that. I just wanna have great sex. Let's check the old spam buggy. Here it is. Virility beam! Okay, I'm feeling it. Dungeons and Dragons builds to make your DM cry. DMs out there, forget about challenge rating around level three and it just ramps from there. You'll want two levels in Paladin to get access to all weapons and all armors, plus your smite. Two levels in Fighter to get your action surge. And the rest of your levels into Cleric. Because the two levels in Paladin and the rest in Cleric, you're technically a level 17 caster, which gives you access to level 9 spell. Use all four and lower spell slots to cast smite. Anything higher for inflict wounds given to you by your Cleric. Max damage at max level without any crits is 210 damage, and that's if you use a 9th level spell slot for one inflict wounds, action surge, and then your 8th level for another inflict wounds, uh, rolling max damage on everything. This is called the Blitzkrieg build. It's my own design, and enjoy. Hi, I'm a D&D &D note taker, and I'd like to share with you some tips. I think note-taking is vital for several reasons, time-saving, role-play, self-reflection skills. Additionally, I love writing and I have players that don't, so. I have four main parts to how I take notes and what formats I use and how to facilitate note-taking, so. First, DM's notes, yeah. Three main aspects are what the NPC knows and what I use in order to improv conversations, what the PCs have asked, and where I'm at with story planning. That has a lot to do with how I run my stories and how I design my games and storytell. Next part will be how I facilitate note-taking for player characters. I want to talk about signal transfer in the D&D spell Dancing Lights. In the spell you can have three different kinds of lights. Globes, torches, or lanterns. You can have each of these be different colors. For simplicity's sake, let's say eight colors total. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, gray, and white. So each light can be in up to 24 different states. And you have four lights. And that's not even including moving them around or making them into lines, squares, or shapes like Tetris pieces. That's 24 to the fourth. So over 300,000 combinations. So I'm thinking about this because in my game, I want there to be a card game based on this.
Hello Dungeon Masters. Tonight is my first session as a DM and I am so nervous. Just finished prepping my social distance setup. Got any tips for a first time DM? Okay, TikTok, listen to me. There are 12 astrological signs and there are 12 classes in Dungeons and Dragons. And I sat down and I correlated every class in Dungeons and Dragons to a class, to an astrological sign. And it works. It's amazing. I'm going to start with my own astrological sign, which is Leo. Obviously, we're the best. And we are sorcerers. Obviously, we're just better than everybody else. Uh, we didn't do anything. We didn't work super hard. We were just born better than everybody else. That's how it works. So, everybody should figure out what their what D and D class their astrological sign correlates to. I already have my list written down, but I want to know how you're wrong. Totally love the campaign so far. I feel like we're all clicking. We're having some really good adventures. It's really cool, right? It's like he gets us as players. Kind of knows what we want to get out of this campaign. It's yeah, it's a really good time. Oh well, yeah, totally. I'm just super glad you guys invited me because this is this has been fantastic. I mean. I don't know what he's on, but he's he's doing something right. <sighs> oh fuck! Shit! Shit! Um, um, the wheel, the wheel, the wheel never fails. All right, here we go. All right, I hope you fuckers like tentacles. Don't make all the consequences for your players' actions negative. It was my homebrew world, and all seven of my players were students at Brightstone Academy. In-game, we had just hit winter break. One of my players had this item. It's called the Chaos Bobble. Chaos I recommend Bobble. that you look it up. And it's this small little charm that every time they rub it, a wild magical effect takes place. So he rubs onto the Chaos Bobble. It sparkles and shines for a moment. And in a flash, him and all of the students around him are polymorphed. Well, this was an opportunity. I could have made them all into snakes or giant spiders or maybe something that would be mistaken for a threat. But instead, I decided to turn them all into wiener dogs. It was one of the cutest moments that I've ever had in D&D. And we all talked about for the next hour what their wiener dogs looked like and what they did and what games they played. And we did a couple dumb skill checks with them. But that's the point. Not every encounter or time that you have in D&D has to be a challenge. Sometimes it can just be fun. I make a D&D video every single day. Like and follow for more. So, you want better representation in your games. Good stuff. Here's how to do it the right way, especially if you or most of your group are not marginalized people, specifically white straight guys. One, don't make it a joke. If you include a trans person or a non-binary character in your campaign, do not make it a joke. It's not funny. It's a serious identity. And if you're making fun of it, then you're actually not doing diversity. You're doing the opposite. Two, be more gracious with yourself in-game than you would in real life about getting people's pronouns and identities correct. The reason for this is that all of the people in your campaign are usually, like, made up. This is especially for DMs. If you're a player character, maybe you take it more seriously. If you're a DM, you made an entire world of characters. The issue stops being about identities themselves and just the sheer quantity of identities that you're trying to keep up with. Finally, if you're white, don't work out your white guilt through this method. If you're white and playing a character of color, you're still engaging with that in your own context. Anyway. Part one of Dan rating monsters from Volo's Guide in one word. Ah. There are going to be many parts of this as there are lots of monsters. Beach, okay, cool, let's go. Uh, friend. Okay, not just one I word, want... like, short description though. Very brief, okay? Very brief. I love them. Uh, Nosferatu, but better. He looks like he goes like this all the time. <laughs> that one's uncle. <laughs> He's been to jail. Does he need a hug? He looks so sad. <laughs> That's what I look like in the pit. What? At a concert. I get up there and I go... <laughs> Like for part two, I, or don't, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> part two of Dan rating monsters from Volo's Guide. I'm evil now. Oh god. <laughs> He's old. New horse. He has a great personality. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful hugs. <laughs> Absolutely spectacular. Do you want me to kill him for you? Yes, please. I, I will. Yes, fucking I'll do it. Motive. Fucking do it. 
those are my friends. That's Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> There's... That's my dad. I'm friends with my dad. There's, um... Sophia. And that's me. Nice. Um... I can't even... What? Who... Who is this? Uh... I bet he kisses with his eyes open. Please come back for part three. <laughs> part three, let's keep it rolling. Uh... He has the same problem as Arceus. This looks like Yargle went terribly wrong. <laughs> also, he'd be really good at picking stuff up. I will... I would give him my wallet if it meant he would leave me alone. I love him down there. Him. <laughs> not monsters. <laughs> Zero out of ten. Not a monster. Very good, beautiful boy, and I love him. This is a uh, um um wow. <laughs> I would pay his tuition. I want to cry. I fucking love flail snail. I wish our party died to flail snail. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Talking about power scaling, part three. Once you get past tier two of play, things start getting a lot harder for the DM, especially the bigger the group is. Tier three is especially tricky, and it encompasses levels 11 through 16. This tier is referred to as the Champions of the Realm. At this point, your players have the capability to go up against minor catastrophes and still win. Then we get into tier 4 plays, Champions of the Multiverse. This is levels 17 through 20. At this point, the players are some of the strongest people in the world and in the multiverse. They can hold their own against m the ma vast majority of threats the universe has to offer. At this point, they should be fighting against things that are targeting entire planes. But it is still important to note that they are not gods. Are you tired of wasting all that movement speed in Dungeons and Dragons when you're already in melee combat with somebody and you spend your attack and then you can't spend any movement because you're already there? Well, here's part one of seven rules I'm stealing from Pathfinder. Because in Pathfinder, they have a three action system where you have three actions that you can spend on stuff. You can spend it on attack, 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 and you have penalties for the later attacks because it's just too much. Or you can move, 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 and you have even more movement if you're just full sprinting. But in Dungeons and Dragons, there's not this option. And if you're already there in combat, you can't just make another swing. But what if you could have this homebrew where you spend all of your movement, not just 30 feet or whatever, all of your entire movement to get a bonus swing at disadvantage? Is that homebrew too much for you? It's okay, it's okay. Instead of just having a free attack, just grant them advantage on an attack. If they stand there, stand their ground, they go all in, spend all their movement, they get advantage, how nice. Or if you like where this is going, just give them the free attack without disadvantage and they spend all their movement to make another attack. It's your homebrew. Follow for part two. D&D TikTok, especially Dungeon Masters, how do you handle magic item shops in your campaign? I personally don't like to have them. I think it makes magic feel too commonplace. If anybody in Civilization has magic items, probably it's in a museum or in their private collection. I think there can be places where they buy potions and scrolls, maybe like a, a local academy has them, or there's a nearby wizard who's willing to part with them. But those are the only kinds of magic items I want people to be able to buy. I once gave a party some options of magic items to take, and they said, well, if we don't get this, then we can go buy one another place. And I said, no, this is not the kind of world where there are magic item shops. You can't just roll up and buy a bag of holding or a jug of alchemy. This is what you get, and if you don't take it, they're going to take it back and put it in a vault. Choose carefully, because the items presented here probably is the only time you're ever going to see these items, except for the potions or the scrolls. Because those are consumables, and people like to make consumables for people to buy, because that's good business. People don't sell the one item they have. Today's magic item is the Bag of Pet Holding. This pouch has a demi-plane inside of it that only beasts can enter. As an action, you can put a friendly, willing beast into the bag, or take out a beast that is currently in the bag. The demi-plane inside of the bag has everything an animal could need. Food, water, a comfortable environment, and entertainment. If the bag is destroyed, all beasts inside of it scatter unharmed into unoccupied spaces nearby. Bags of pet holding come in different sizes, and their capacity is represented by pet slots. A tiny beast takes one slot, a small one takes two, a medium one takes four, and a large beast takes eight slots. 
A bag could have anywhere from 2 to 16 slots, but they're usually in the 4 to 8 range. If a friendly beast that has spent at least 8 hours in the bag is reduced to 0 hit points and you can see it, you can use your reaction to teleport it into the bag before it takes the damage. You can do this once per animal per day. If your party finds a bag of pet holding in a dungeon or loot pile, it might have a pet or two already inside of it. What kind of critters would your character carry around in this bag? Wait, you're a professional DM? That's a thing that people can do? How did you get into this? How can I get into this? How? Just literally how? So many of you had so many questions about how I got into my profession. So quick bullet points. My husband is a teacher. He developed his own system, started running it after school with kids. Kids loved it. It exploded. We had to bring in more people and teach them the system. And I was one of the people that got brought in. And now we're also offering games for adult professionals for team building exercises. So I also have a part-time job doing something else. And my husband right now is a teacher, but he's actually quitting this year to become a storyteller full time. It's a little nerve wracking. Hopefully we will be successful. Already we've seen our company grow and expand exponentially. So it's a bit of a risk, but we're willing to take it because we really believe bringing tabletop role-playing games to the greater world is important. I've tried a lot of minis over the years and you can get stuff from the dollar store. I was going to get these guys used like for giants, maybe hot glue, some pennies, their feet, so they stand up better. But my favorite is still just using a D4 and then boom, there's your character. I mean, I have a few little goblins or whatnot, gerblins. I tried making these little gerblin ones that could, uh, you know, once they were defeated, you just flip them over, have the X on them. These are paper. This is actually from, like, Kev's Dungeon Craft, Paper Craft. Those things are kind of cool. They're a bit much work. <laughs> but I got a bunch of these still to uh, use if I want. The point is I don't want players to have to give up a weapon that fits them thematically because the bonuses aren't high enough. I agree completely. I think customizable weapons is the way to go um and this is actually what i do in my own homebrew world let me tell you how in most games i play when the players defeat a creature they want to harvest what they can from that creature or if they find something in the wilderness they want to harvest what they can introduce specialized shops that allow them to incorporate those things into their weapons and equipment let me give you an example uh, one city I have has this shop called the Armored Bullet. It's run by this uh, female half-elf. I forget the name off the top of my head. Basically, she was trained and taught how to smith by dwarves of the Undercity that was below their city. I'm sorry, I'm going to need a part two for this. Roll for initiative. At the start of combat, characters make a dexterity roll called initiative. The higher the roll, the quicker the character is able to act, and the sooner they take their turn. If a character is taken by surprise, they are unable to act at all during the first round. On their turn, the character can move, take an action, and a bonus action. Is it too late to well? All of which take place in 6 seconds of the game. Each character takes their turn one after the other to make up one round of combat. But in game, all the turns in a round happen at once, so a round looks something like this. Flippity flip! Die! Disengage, motherfuckers! Today's magic item is the Adventurer's Compass. Normally, this uncommon wondrous item works like an ordinary compass, pointing northward. But when you activate it as an action, it will instead point in the direction of the nearest point of interest that you haven't yet explored, as decided by the DM, within one mile of you. The point of interest could be a location, item, person, phenomena, as long as it's interesting. The point of interest will also have one or more of the following descriptors attached to it, indicated by the symbols on the outer rim of the compass. Unsolved mystery, guarded secret, treacherous challenge, valuable asset, Rare Oddity, Endangered Innocent, Historical Relic, or Point of No Return. After being activated, the needle will continue pointing towards the point of interest for one hour. If you are holding it, you will have an approximate idea of the distance it is from you, give or take 100 feet. The number of times this can be used per day is up to the DM. If you just want to use this to keep your players moving along the main linear plot, once per day is reasonable. If you encourage your players to go wandering down side quests all the time, it could be a few times per day. What would your character hope to find around the corner with this compass? So, um... DM confession, I have never run a actual game of D&D &D in my life. I play D&D &D a lot. I am, uh, I 
I love D&D. I play it so much, but I have never actually run a game of D&D. I do run games though. I've run, uh, I do constantly run every week on Thursday on Nerdlandia G. Uh, I run Monster of the Week and I have run games of Kids on Brooms. So I still consider myself a DM, even though people seem to think that's only for d and I'm a DM, a GM, or a keeper, I guess. But um, I'm actually running my first D&D campaign this summer, uh, Hecna, Carnival of Horrors. I can't wait till that comes. I can't wait to do this. Um, but yeah, so I've never run D&D, but I've run plenty of other games and played plenty of D&D, so I still consider myself a DM. Hey. Remember how last week I said there was a uh, D&D one shot on my YouTube? Part two, the final conclusion of it, is now up as well. It is a five and a half hour episode. You should watch it if you have nothing to do today, or if you just want background noise. Go check it up YouTube in the bio. Yeah, enjoy the D&D. What do you have there, Brian? <laughs> it's a cup of dirt. <laughs> just put an F on there and let me go home. <laughs> well, explain it. <laughs> well, it's a cup with dirt in it. I call it cup of dirt. Hello again, D&D TikTok. Looking for tips again. <clears throat> so I got invited to a second campaign, which I'm very excited about. Uh, they told me in the initial pitch that they were looking for a high charisma character, which is great because I've been wanting to play a sorcerer. Ideally, I'd really like to play Aberrant Mind, but I wouldn't say no to Divine Soul either. And uh, I wouldn't say no to uh, Wild Magic either, depending on how the DM ran the surge. Unfortunately, this campaign doesn't have resource sharing turned on, so the only thing available is in the basic rules, which is Draconic Bloodlines, which I don't really want. And I don't own any of the books digitally. My other campaign uh, does have resource sharing turned on, so I'm able to see all the material, but I can't access them for my character creation. To make it matters worse, I've been unemployed for over a year, so I'm not looking to spend much money on this. Does anyone have any tips for getting the most bang for your buck on D&D Beyond? I think for getting the most for what I want, I'd need the PHB, uh, Xanathar's, and Tasha's, but I don't know. Okay, bye. Sorry about the mess. I've really let the place go since you killed me. By the way, thanks for that. Sarcasm self-test complete. Oh good, that's back online. I'll start getting everything else working while you perform this first simple test. Y you don't sound Russian? How could I sound anything, silly? I'm plastic. I don't even have a voice box. I had to borrow this one. Uh, don't you don't sound Russian? How could I sound anything, silly? I'm plastic. I don't even have a voice box. I had to borrow this one. Uh, don't turn on the light. Are you, are you going to kill me? No! I mean, yes, but not for a good long while yet. I don't want you to go to waste. Then, no, then, then w w what? Then why are you here? You, you don't sound Russian? How could I sound anything, silly? I'm plastic. I don't even have a voice box. I had to borrow this one. Uh, Don't turn on the light. Are you, are you going to kill me? No! I mean, yes, but not for a good long while yet. I don't want you to go to waste. Then, no, then, then what? Then why are you here? After you attacked poor Sarah, I thought it was about time we had a good old... You don't sound Russian? How could I sound anything, silly? I'm plastic. I don't even have a voice box. I had to borrow this one. Uh, don't turn on the light. Are you, are you going to kill me? No! I mean, yes, but not for a good long while yet. I don't want you to go to waste. Then, no, then, then w w what? Then why are you here? After you attacked poor Sarah, I thought it was about time we had a good old... You don't sound Russian? 
How could I sound anything silly? I'm plastic. I don't even have a voice box. I had to borrow this one. Uh, don't turn on the light. Are, are you going to kill me? No! I mean, yes, but not for a good long while yet. I don't want you to go to waste. Then, no, then, then what? Then why are you here? After you attacked poor Sarah, I thought it was about time we had a good old... Explaining the entity the teacher. The teacher will wander the halls with a key from 8pm to 9pm and sometimes does even enter a room. But when he does enter a room, he will torture whoever has the worst grade in your classroom. If everyone has a grade that's exactly the same, but it's lower than an A, he will torture everyone in the room. But if you all have an A, he'll leave you all B. Avoiding this entity is actually more difficult than it seems. So your grades are based off tests, and your tests are extremely difficult. You can try to avoid him, sure. At 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., just don't be in your classroom. Here's the problem with that. After 12 p.m. until 12 a.m., the hallways are crawling with imposters and entities that are extremely hostile during this time. My only advice would be to stay quiet, stay hidden, and try to do good on your tests. Can you show us how you would set up a camp? Yeah, I'm always looking for something that already exists. And for me, it's rock shelters. So you can kind of see I got this big flat rock right here. And it looks like a nice little spot I can crawl in for the night. Now I just gotta reinforce it with some warming layers. I got some pine branches, gonna stick these up underneath. I'm gonna lay on the green. This will keep me up off the ground. Let's go get some pine needles. Let's do one more load. It's about it. Nice dry place to sleep tonight. Nice little warming fire. Finn and I will tuck up in there for the night. We get to go. Listen, last year the number of civilians who were killed from airstrikes in Afghanistan increased by 300% since 2017. There are currently 2 million orphans in Afghanistan and the numbers are only increasing. I teamed up with Children Without Borders, which is a non-profit organization with the mission of eradicating child labor in underdeveloped countries. I understand that not everyone may have the money to donate, so therefore I am offering 100% of all streaming proceeds for my song titled Stop Killing Afghans to Children Without Borders. This means that if we get enough awareness of the cause by liking, commenting, and sharing, we can directly use TikTok to donate and help change the lives of millions of innocent children. You don't have to be Afghan to be impacted by this. You just have to be human. So so I saw this game where you have to try to connect the dots and make a little rectangle using the whirlpool effect. Let's see how I do. I just turned the effect on. Look at this. Oh my god. This is going to be hard. What the hell? And we're starting. Okay. No. I got that one. Let's move down. It's just a straight line. It's all in your head. It's all in your head. Let's go to the side. Okay. You got this. Where's the other dot? You'll stop moving. Oh, that might have been nice. Let's go up. Just move up. No, why are you turning backwards? No, 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 no. Okay, I got it, I got it. Let's go up here. Oh, Jesus. Okay, across. It's just a straight line. Boom. Okay, uh, let's turn off the effect. Oh, my God. The fuck? Why is Gen Z so volatile? It seems like they're always rioting or complaining about something. They're never happy. Yes, I wonder why. We were born too late to discover the world and too early to discover the stars. We were born into one of the worst economic recessions in American history. We've seen nothing but endless wars our entire lives. We've seen as the establishment government snuffs out any dissent even from inside its own parties. We've watched as the potential of social media was squashed out in favor of corporate political tools. We've learned from the mistakes of the millennials and refused to fall into the same traps, yet find it even harder to find another way around. We live in a time where jobs that have been safe for centuries are disappearing on a daily basis. We've watched as a nation that once led the world in democracy and freedom has squandered itself into factions who promise change but do nothing. Yes, I wonder why it is we're always so angry about everything. Wow, that was fucking dark! What's poppin'? Top five regrets of the dying. Let's get into it. Number one, 
They wish they hadn't worked so hard. Most of these jobs, although necessary, don't really care about you. And when you die, they'll replace you that day. Number two, they wish they'd had the courage to express themselves openly, honestly, and truly. Which brings me to three, they wish they'd had the courage to live the life that they truly wanted to live, make the decisions that they felt called to make. Number four, they wish they had stayed in touch with their friends more. Number five, they wish they would have allowed themselves to take more chances. Every day that you wake up is a chance for you to live it differently than you did the day before. Hey TikTok, I've been learning about this trend called shifting. People meditate and find their ability to transport themselves into fantasy worlds like Harry Potter. To me, it just seemed like really deep daydreaming, and so I talked to some people about it. They turn off their cell phone, they meditate for a bit, and they are able to transport themselves into these vivid stories that they've created in their head. Again, it sounded like regular daydreaming. But here's where it gets scary, and I start sounding like an old man. I asked each of them what the big difference was between the shifting and just a really deep daydream. And every single one said they had never really had a really deep daydream. I used to have them a whole lot when I was younger, and I figured I just grew out of it or something. But here's my theory. Every single person I spoke to was under 25 and had always had the internet and cell phones within an arm's reach. I never really thought about having constant stimulation at your fingertips, but I wonder whether or not that is actually preventing people from developing the skill to deeply daydream. So when people take the time to explore their own psyche, they think they have superpowers. I have no evidence to back this up, but I'm going to look into it. Be safe out there, everybody. Why does it always seem like a killer in a horror movie knows your house better than you know your own house? Like, you're tearing up the stairs running from him, but he's already there like he found a secret doorway that led up there or something you didn't know about? I gotta study some maps and shit, damn. Hey guys, it's my birthday today, so we're gonna be celebrating with George. Obviously, he's not allowed to have the cake, but what I've done is made special cupcakes just for him. They're meat cupcakes, so we're gonna give him one. Have to take it. We're going to have to take it out for you. Sit. Sit. Good boy. Oh. oh. <laughs> Definitely the best birthday. Hey guys, I'm Frank. I'm 29, married, and I live overseas in England because that's where the U.S. Air Force decided to station me for the last four years of my life. And in case you haven't noticed already, I'm a pretty big nerd. Like, a really big nerd. I got into 3D printing almost two years ago because I really wanted to make my own 3D printed Iron Man suit. I had no idea what I was about to get myself into and before you ask, yeah, I can wear the suit. I was always under the assumption this was a rich person's hobby, but believe me, I'm no rich boy. But what I did have was a really big passion to build and create. And this hobby unlocked a whole new world of me being able to make basically anything that I could put my imagination to. Now I'll be the first to admit that maybe I got a little carried away. But if I didn't go this hard, then I wouldn't be able to teach you guys all the things I've learned along the way. This is the coolest hobby in the world, and I've met some of the coolest people in the world because of it. So there's really no time like the present to jump in and give it a shot. Take care. Hold up, this is the hardest would you rather question ever, but it's world edition. I'm gonna give you four different worlds you could live in. You just have to pick wisely. Let's go. Option number one, you get to live in a beautiful, amazing planet that's super far away from Earth. But there are tons of child slaves there, and you're gonna have to save every single one of them before you live your life. Option number two, you'll be able to live in a world where there's only models that exist, but your insecurities will be enhanced. But because of your insecurities, you'll be actually the most beautiful person on Earth. Option number three, you'll be able to live in a world exactly like anime, but you'll have to deal with the worst of the worst when it comes to anime. And option number four, you'll be able to live life just like a superhero. But you'll be bound to one state and you'll never get rid of all the enemies. Did you pick wisely or did you make a very big mistake? This is one of my closest friends in the world, Harland, who has autism. My whole life. And one summer we wanted to go to the regional theme park for my birthday and we found out that the aides of someone with a disability get into the park for free. But Harland had a season pass to that park anyway. So I figured if they thought that I was Harlan's aide, that I could get in for free too. And when I tried explaining to Harlan in a nice way, hey man, when you get up to the front gate, just kind of bring out your autism a little bit. He cut me off to say, So we're going to exploit my disability for your own personal financial gain. And when I tried saying, well, Harlan, it's not really exactly like that. I'm in. <laughs> he cut me off to say, I'm in. So when he got up to the front gate, he leaped over the gate, slammed his head into the glass of the ticket booth, and started naming Civil War statistics over and over and over. And when I said, I'm just here with Harland, the ticket booth worker asked no questions, and the both of us got into that park for free.
True story. I was there. Safest country in the world is Iceland. Crime rate is so low, police don't even carry guns, making them very approachable. The SWAT team does possess firearms, but they rarely use them because the murder rate is normally between 0 and 1.5 a year. There's not a lot of reason to commit crimes since a college degree is less expensive than one month's rent. They have a high employment rate and they have social safety nets in place. They are the most gender equal country in the world and their pride is the only one that's never been protested. There's no harmful animals except this cutie who doesn't bother people. They don't even have mosquitoes. It's so safe that people often leave their babies outside in strollers to sleep because they know no one will take them. If you think or know your computer's been hacked, here's what you can do right now to stop it. First things first, unplug your internet. Without internet, they'll lose connection to your computer and this will buy you some time to figure out what's going on and stop them from doing any further damage. If you have a virus scanner that works with the internet, go ahead and run that now. If not, you want to boot your computer into safe mode with networking. To do that, go to your start menu, go to settings. This will bring up this window. Go to update and security. Come down here to recovery. Go to advanced startup and hit restart now. After you reboot, this screen will come up. Go to troubleshoot, advanced options, startup settings, and hit restart. From here, you'll want to enable safe mode with networking, which is number five. This puts your computer in a very limited state and will only run the basic Windows stuff and won't run any other programs such as Trojans. From there, feel free to connect back to your internet and go download some antivirus software. For Trojans and Backdoors, which is what I mainly show on here, I recommend Malwarebytes and Bitdefender. But different virus scanners pick up different things, so use whatever you want. Follow for more. So your back hurts? Yeah, I'm a Cairo. I'll show you how to stretch it. Sit up, leg up, bend it. Hold for 30 seconds. Then switch it. I'm a Cairo. Hey Google, stop music. What are you doing? What am I doing? What are you doing? We're having spa day. Spa day, okay. Alright, enough of this nonsense. Let's go, Chase. Come on. He doesn't want to go with you. Let's go, Chase. He's Come on. Ugh, fine. Hey Google, play. Hey Google, stop music. Wait, you're already home? This again? Yeah, it's spa day. <sighs> I'm just so over at this point. Come on, guys, let's go. Come on. Leave him alone. Chase, come on. <sighs> hey Google, play. Jesus, I just don't understand it, to be honest. I just don't get it anymore. <sighs> Whatever. Um, Dad, you like it? Are you kidding me? All right? This is so much fun. Are you serious? Dude, you're ruining our bowl of that. What have you done to my cats? We're just enjoying our time. This isn't normal! Yes, it is! There's nothing about this is normal! Oh my god. Let me get you guys out. Hold on. Give me just a towel. Let me get a towel. Bedtime? I'm sorry, are we expecting? Well, I gotta improvise since you always kick him out of the bed. So you put my cats in a bassinet? Shh, it's story time. You guys ready to learn your ABCs? Alright, here we go. Come on, Chase, this is ridiculous. Come on. Come on, babies. You're ruining Come on. Your story time. Come on, mommy.
There's this show called MacGyver about a guy who uses whatever he has on hand to get himself out of bad situations. In this one, he makes sunglasses that can hide his face from security cameras. This is so cool, and I needed to know if it actually works. So I got some oversized sunglasses, some LED light remotes, and then took them apart to take out the infrared LED. Then I took out the batteries and attached them to the infrared LEDs and attached them to the sunglasses, just like MacGyver did in the show. To test it out, I'm just using a standard Wi-Fi security camera. I walked by the camera with and without the glasses, and they kind of worked. So I got some super bright infrared LEDs and remade the glasses myself. And it actually worked. Men are so quick to be like, I don't know why women don't want me. I have so much to offer. Show me your bed frame. So this is my bed frame. Uh, it's a loft bed. Uh, I built it myself. I've got my desk and my computer underneath on this side. And then I've got my bookshelf on the other side. The reason that I wanted to build a loft style bed is because I wanted to make room for all my Legos. And then I have other Legos on this side. And I also wanted to be able to work out in my room. So there's all my workout equipment and like I've got, I've got plenty of space. So that's nice. The only bad part about having a loft bed is I have to use this sketchy step ladder to get all the way up to the top. Now I do have two pillows on top as well as my second sheet. So I have a full set of sheets. Um, I do sleep in a sleeping bag because I don't like to make my bed in the morning. So the sleeping bag works. And I do have a third pillow, but that's my cuddling pillow. Um, and I like brown women, so the brown pillow works for that. Uh, first off, I wanna thank you for staying until the very end of the video. And I want to end this video by giving three people a shout out. Um, I want to give a shout out to the King Blackhawk, and I want to give a shout out to Strange Gamer Girl. Those two are like me in the sense that they are up and coming YouTubers, so if you want to say that you knew them before they were famous, please check the link in the description to go see their channels. And I want to give a uh, happy birthday to my cousin Giovanni. Uh, Gio, if you're watching this, happy birthday. And uh, I also want to announce that I have made a subreddit, r slash zero easy. So if you're uh, interested in uh, the things I do in the community tab, the character creations and the... Uh, scenarios and stuff like that then please uh, check out my subreddit where we do more of that as well as other stuff and i've also been thinking about um uh, using stereo in the future so let me know if you're if you would be interested in that and uh to let me know that you made it until the very end of the video please comment happy birthday Giovanni and r slash zero easy and uh, with that being said again thank you for watching the video uh, stay safe and god bless you